This patient is wearing Essex retainers. They are practically invisible and make the teeth look brilliant. They provide absolute stability, are easily fabricated, have minimal bulk, high strength, and don't interfere with speech. They snap into place without clasps, require no adjustment, can be made at a fraction of the cost of conventional retainers, and when retention directives are followed, do not alter the functional quality of the bite. Fabrication of an Essex appliance requires the attention to detail that's associated with crown and bridge technology. The success of the appliance is ultimately related to these, the accurate impression and the precision cast. There are two basic types of Essex appliances, cuspid to cuspid and full arch. Let's review the rationale and fabrication of the cuspid to cuspid appliance. I prefer it because the anterior teeth are held in their aesthetic position while the posterior teeth are free to adapt to diet, lifestyle, function, and aging. The impression sequence for the cuspid to cuspid appliance is as follows. Use a rugged, disposable anterior impression tray, one that fits either arch. The impression material I prefer is vinyl polysiloxane for dimensional accuracy and registering detail, there's simply none better. The impression can be stored for months without distorting and can be re-poured multiple times. A polyvinyl siloxane impression requires a combination of injectable wash and heavy bodied materials. The heavy bodied material, called putty, provides stability to the impression. This is how to use it. Need an equal amount of activator and base components with vinyl or unpowdered latex gloves because powder retards the setting. The blended unstreaked putty is placed in the cuspid to cuspid section of the tray. The syringe or wash material records precise interdental detail. It is supplied in cartridges and dispensed mechanically. This is imperative because retention of the cuspid to cuspid appliance is determined by the retentive undercuts gingival to contact points and they must be exactly recorded. There are two ways to take vinyl polysiloxane impressions, two stage and one stage. The two stage method takes a bit more chair time because two separate setting times are involved, one for the injectable material and one for the putty. However, the technique is user friendly and might be more efficient when initially working with this material. First, dry the cuspid to cuspid teeth and seat the heavy bodied material over the anterior teeth. When it's set, remove the tray by pulling down on the buccal section flange. Then, place the injectable material into the cuspid to cuspid crown section of the impression and reseat the tray. To determine when the wash material is set, place a bead on the patient's hand. When it's firm, remove the tray by dislodging it in the buckle section. The quicker impression technique, the one-step method, involves less chair time because the wash and heavy-bodied material set simultaneously. But this requires some experience with the material. For this procedure, mix the heavy bodied material and place it in the tray as previously described. Then immediately inject the wash around the necks of the teeth and into proximals and seat the tray containing the heavy bodied material. It will force the wash material into the interproximals. When the tray is removed, check for accuracy and extension of the impression of at least five millimeters onto the labial and lingual gingiva. Rinse the impression in water. Prior to pour up, block the impression distal to the cuspids with wax, block out compound, or even better, pop top tabs recovered from a soft drink can. After trimming the size of the tabs with crown and bridge scissors, 
so that they will not distort the tray laterally, slide them into the impression angulated about 20 degrees from the base to the distal contact point of the cuspid. A squirt of debubbleizing solution will minimize air voids in the cast. Wait one hour before pouring up with Essex stone. This stone is incredibly strong with minimal setting expansion, and this reduces the probability of an oversized cast, which in turn would result in an oversized appliance. Essex stone is so dense and set so smoothly that a separating medium is not required. The cast should be trimmed so that the long axis of the crowns are perpendicular to the base. The height of the cast should not exceed three quarters of an inch. It's imperative to have a small cast. The heels of the cast should taper from the base to the distal of the cuspid due to the previously angulated placement of the pop top stops in the impression. The cast is evaluated for undercuts gingival to the contact points. Only those that are very severe, such as three-cornered spaces, should be de-emphasized with bonding resin or better yet, light-cured composite gel. Wiping the gel into a deep undercut reduces it to more normal contour. In a similar manner, voids or cast flaws can be filled in. Don't use wax to block out undercuts. The heat generated during thermoforming will melt it. However, it is imperative that adequate undercuts gingival to the contact points are not removed. These undercuts ensure a positive, that's a snap-in fit. If the interproximal undercuts are not distinct, it's advisable to emphasize them with judicious trimming of the summit of the swollen interdental gingiva on the cast. And now to thermoform the plastic over the cast. The thermoforming machines used to fabricate Essex retainers are either pressure or vacuum. Machines such as Biostar, Ministar, or Ercopress operate by forcing the plastic over the cast by pressure rather than sucking it around the cast by vacuum. An acceptable Essex retainer can be fabricated from these machines. However, they are expensive, costing many times more than vacuum devices. If you're using a pressure machine, I suggest the following guidelines. Position the cast in the metal pellets to assure plastic adaptation that will extend well onto the facial and lingual gingiva. A code provided by the manufacturer can be entered into the machine and is correlated with plastic type and thickness. And now about vacuum machines. I prefer the Essex machine by Raintree. It's relatively inexpensive, about one-tenth the cost of a pressure machine, and is modified to induce a powerful vacuum force. This is done by enlarging and creating more holes for the vacuum to express itself, and by placing a gasket on the base plate. The gasket blocks out the peripheral holes, concentrating and amplifying the vacuum into the center of the base plate where the casts are placed. Since Essex casts are so small, one or two can still be placed inside the gasket. If you have an older vacuum unit, contact the Raintree Essex Corporation for modification instructions. Prior to thermoforming plastic, the heating element of a vacuum unit should be operating at maximum temperature. This takes about three minutes. During this time, the cast should be heated because hot plastic will adapt more tenaciously to a warm rather than a cold cast. To warm the cast, place it on top of the heating element while it's getting to thermoforming temperature. Place the cast on the base plate, and then you're ready to thermoform a sheet of Essex plastic over the cast. 
There are two basic types of Essex plastic, type A and type C. The difference between them is a slight amount of brilliance and the toughness of each plastic. Essex A plastic is brilliantly clear and induces a sparkle to the teeth. It's ideal for the appliance that's to be worn full time, that is in public, when perceived aesthetics is so important. For instance, the appliances applicable with A plastic are tooth moving appliances, temporary bridges, or bleaching trays. Essex type C plastic is the only plastic on the market specifically formulated for dental use. For resistance to wear, clarity, and resilience, there's simply no other plastic like it on the market. Although slightly less brilliant when compared to Essex A plastic, it still has exceptional clarity. Only the patient and the clinician will know it's in place. Essex type C plastic is ideal for routine retention due to its resistance to wear. This feature is most appreciated if the patient is a constant or episodic bruxer. Essex type C plastic appears slightly cloudy in sheet form, but due to the heat of the thermoforming unit, it becomes clear with a very light pearlescence to amplify the aesthetics of the teeth. Since Essex appliances are always delivered in pairs, two Essex Type C devices should be provided for retention. And data indicate that after a very short period of full-time wear, a week at most, they should be worn at night only. Let's talk about thermoforming brilliantly clear Essex type A plastic first. After removing the protective scratch covering from both sides of the plastic sheet, place it in the vacuum machine, making sure it's centered and firmly locked within the holding mechanism. Heat the plastic sheet until it sags about one half inch. That's slightly below the bottom edge of the clamping mechanism. It should take approximately 25 to 30 seconds. Heating times may vary slightly because of local current fluctuations. Again, don't try to get better adaptation with Essex A plastic by letting it sag beyond one half inch. The appliance will be too thin and the physical properties of the plastic change due to this excessive heat. When the plastic starts to heat sag, it does so rapidly. So don't hesitate. When the plastic sags one half inch, turn the vacuum motor switch to the on position and immediately pull the plastic over the cast. The minimal thickness of Essex sheet will be reduced to about one half of its original thickness during thermoforming. There's a way to supercharge the process with type A plastic. Immediately after thermoforming, while the plastic is still formable, press a small ball burnisher or very tapered metal instrument into the retentive undercuts gingival to contact points. Now let's talk about thermoforming Essex type C plastic. Type C Essex plastic does not thermoform like type A. It takes more time to get to thermoforming temperature, about 55 seconds, and it doesn't sag uniformly. It initially is thermophilic, that is, it draws toward the heat source. Then it levels out with a slight surface waviness and will sag very slightly, about a quarter of an inch. If you find the plastic after thermoforming to be excessively thin, it's due to excessive heating. Again, you can emphasize the interproximal undercuts immediately after thermoforming by forcing a small tipped instrument into the undercuts gingival to contact points. Cast can easily be removed intact from the plastic sheet 
by using the following guidelines. Trim away excess plastic with a curved Mayo scissors. Then cut away the plastic over the distal ends of the cast. Flex the lingual surface of the Essex away from the cast. Slip a thin bladed instrument between the labial plastic and the cast and gently pry the cast out of the plastic. And this is where the importance of quality stone comes in. You don't want the teeth or parts of the cast fracturing. If you provide duplicate Essex retainers, which I strongly recommend, the intact cast is available for a second fabrication. Now about final trimming and seating an Essex retainer. Grinding on the plastic is not necessary. Curved Mayo scissors are used to trim the edges to proper form. A few guidelines. Do not scallop the labial flange of the retainer to conform to the cervical line. Instead, Extend it two to three millimeters on the labial gingiva and trim to a continuous gentle curve. Trim the lower lingual flange in a similar manner. Trim the lingual of the upper appliance in a gentle curve from cuspid to cuspid. If adjustments at the chair are necessary, trim with the small scissors, ligature cutters, or scalpel. There should be a small space between the marginal gingiva and the edge of the appliance in the cuspid area. This gives the patient a fingernail purchase to remove the appliance along the long axis of the incisors. Essex retainers should be delivered no more than two days after braces are removed. Since the teeth may shift ever so slightly during this period, they revert to the debonding position when the appliance is placed. However, during the few minutes this correction is taking place, the appliance will feel tight. Not to worry, reassure the patient that this will dissipate in a few minutes. It is important that the retainer does not slip easily over the teeth, but requires reasonable pressure to flex over into proximal undercuts gingival to the contact point. Essex retainers are more easily removed by dislodging one corner of the appliance first, then the other. And now about instructions to the patient. Two retainers are supplied to enable the patient to comply with permanent retention. Without a backup system to prevent the disruption from lost, broken, or worn out retainers, the concept of constant retention is meaningless. If one of the duplicate retainers is lost or destroyed, this contingency is avoided. That is, the patient can contact the office for a replacement, and until it is delivered, they can use their duplicate. Clinicians who, for whatever reason, are concerned about the possibility of post-treatment open bite prefer full arch rather than cuspid to cuspid appliances. Let's talk about the fabrication. Quality alginate can be used for a full arch impression, not only because of the cost factor, but there are over twice the retentive undercuts gingival to contact points on full arch casts. The base of the cast should be trimmed into the depth of the palate for adequate vacuum force around the cast. Since the full arch appliance will be U or horseshoe shaped, this area does not have to be recorded. Again, the cast should be as small as possible in height, no more than two centimeters. A modified gasket that will accommodate the larger full arch cast is centered on the base plate. Full arch appliances are fabricated from type C Essex plastic to withstand buckle section occlusal forces. The appliance is trimmed to approximate form on the cast with a serrated edged 
cutting wheel. It's trimmed to extend two to three millimeters onto the gingiva. The distal of the upper terminal molar can be cut away since it's not in occlusion with the opposing arch, and it makes it easier to remove the cast from the plastic sheet when levering it off the cast with a thin bladed instrument. Final trimming is done with curved Mayo scissors. Recent data has given us some direction on the schedule of wear. Two separate studies at different universities have reported similar results. That is, when cuspid to cuspid Essex appliances are worn at night only, the incidence of appliance-induced anterior open bite is not statistically significant. Therefore, it would be prudent to get the patient into night-only regime as soon as possible. I suggest full-time wear for a few days to a week after appliance delivery. This very limited full-time wear allows the patient to get used to the appliance. There's a practical side of night-only wear also. Since Essex appliances are so small and practically invisible, they can easily be lost during the day. Night-only wear precludes this aggravation. They may be misplaced, but they're still in the house. Also, a streak of nail polish on the lingual makes them easier to spot. The patient should be informed that they will receive two retainers so they can comply with long-term retention directors. Without a backup system to prevent interruptions from lost, broken, or worn out retainers, the long-term concept of retention is meaningless. And here's a nice touch. Attractive soft storage cases, rather than the hard, bulky plastic types, are appropriate for Essex retainers because they're nearly impervious to breaking or distortion. Essex appliances should be correlated with patient behavior. If the patient has displayed poor hygiene, the interproximal gingiva is severely edematous and a casual attitude about treatment has been evident, it might be better to place a bonded appliance, wait for the tissue to normalize, and perhaps for the patient to mature a bit. Then, use an Essex retainer as an exit appliance, that is, after the bonded retainer is removed. Essex appliances can be cleaned with a toothbrush and soapy water. Don't use toothpaste. It dulls the appliance. Also, an effervescent denture cleaner does an excellent job and leaves a fresh taste on the appliance. If an edge of the appliance irritates the tissue, the patient can trim it with a cuticle scissors or file it smooth with an emery board. Let's talk about tooth movement with Essex appliances. Movement occurs when there is adequate force coupled with space for the tooth to move into. Force and space can be combined within an Essex appliance in a unique concept called divots and windows. The divot provides the force in the seated appliance. The window provides unimpeded tooth movement. Here's how to make the window. It's cut into the Essex appliance with an acrylic burr turning at slow speed. Then the borders are detailed with a scalpel. Since tooth movement must be unimpeded, it's better to err on the side of a bigger rather than a smaller window. A three to four millimeter gingival border of plastic should be apparent for strength and resiliency. A technical imperative, create the window before the divot. This precludes clipping of the divot with the burr when establishing the window. Also, there's better visual access when making the divot. Now, let's create the force-inducing divot. It's incorporated into the Essex at a specific point to induce force. This is how it's done. We're going to place this one millimeter divot directly in the Essex appliance. 
when the appliance is seated, it will exert force. The divot can be made in a variety of ways, but this is the method I prefer. The temperature in the shaft of this relatively inexpensive unit called the divoter will form the divot. The amount of heat can be varied with this control for various thicknesses of plastic. The heating shaft is 1.5 millimeters in diameter and has a rounded end. As such, it is an excellent precision thermoforming tool. The shaft of the divoter should be completely free of debris. Use fine grit sandpaper supplied with the unit for cleaning the tip prior to every use. When the divoter is at thermoforming temperature, it takes about 10 seconds, slowly press it into the plastic at the exact point the divot is to be placed. Check the inside of the appliance to monitor the depth of the forming divot. To prevent distorting the divot when removing the heated shaft, turn the unit off. Don't attempt to remove the shaft from the plastic until it's cooled or else the divot will be distorted. The divot can be sequentially modified throughout treatment. For example, after the tooth has moved one millimeter, the divot can be made deeper to affect additional movement. Simply place the tip in the existing divot and deepen it one millimeter. This can be repeated until the treatment goal is achieved. Since divot depth is proportional to force, excessive depth is proportional to excessive pressure. Therefore, only activate that is increased divot depth one millimeter at a time. It would be prudent to limit correction to three millimeters. If the discrepancy is greater, fixed appliances might be the better option. The plastic within the divot becomes thinner with successive thermal modifications. Therefore, use one millimeter Essex plastic sheet, that's 40 thousandths of an inch, rather than the standard 30 thousandths used for other Essex appliances. This makes a slightly thicker appliance, but the divot is sturdier. If on sequential modifications, the divot appears too flimsy, it can be reinforced in one of two ways. First, by placing bonding composite in the divot and allowing it to cure. This effectively converts the hollow divot into a shaft of solid plastic. Another way to beef up the divot is to cut a small square, about five millimeters, from a piece of scrap Essex plastic. Pick it up with the heated shaft of the divoter and create the divot or reline the original one. Now the divot walls are double thick. To be sure that adequate divot force is being applied, I use the patient's input. After seating the appliance, I ask if there is pressure against the target tooth. If yes, send them on their way. If no, make the divot slightly larger. Depending upon placement, the divot can induce a variety of biomechanical forces. Placed incisally, more tipping. Gingively, more bodily movement. Distally, movement about a mesial vertical axis. Placed mesially, movement about a distal vertical axis. Space for rotation about an off-center vertical axis is accomplished by locking the acceptable contact point within the Essex appliance, cutting the window over the remaining service and creating the divot adjacent to the out of line contact point. It has been stated that, quote, the ability to control root position is a major limitation of removable appliances, unquote. This may be applicable to conventional devices, but divots and windows with Essex appliances change centralities. 
divot-induced torque is mechanically more efficient than that induced by rectangular wires since the distance between the moment arms induced by divots, which is measured in millimeters, is much greater than the width of a rectangular bracket slot measured in thousandths of an inch. Exclusive root torque can be realized by capping the incisal edge within the appliance and placing the divot near the gingival border. This induces root movement without concomitant incisal edge displacement. Let's look at some cases where minor tooth movement was accomplished with divots and windows. The following case involved the realignment of maxillary incisors. A late middle-aged female presented with a chief complaint of malaligned upper incisors. Buccal section intercuspation was acceptable. She had previous orthodontic treatment and was reluctant to go through another round of fixed appliances. She wanted her teeth aligned with efficient aesthetic treatment. Lots of emphasis on aesthetic. The case required three millimeters of labial movement of the maxillary lateral incisors. Consequently, three divot modifications, one millimeter each, created the force necessary for alignment. When the patient and I were satisfied with the results, duplicate conventional Essex retainers were delivered with appropriate comments about permanent retention. Treatment time was four months. Chair time was minimal, involving impressions, placing the appliance, and deepening the original divot twice. This case involved improving incisor alignment after debonding. The lower right lateral was slightly out of line, but not noticed when appliances were removed. However, it was apparent on the cast constructed for a lower Essex retainer. A one millimeter divot was placed within the facial plastic of the lower right lateral and a window cut on the lingual surface. The appliance was placed, the patient was seen one week later, and the lateral was aligned. Then, duplicate conventional Essex appliances were delivered. Essex technology, coupled with divots and windows, can induce a variety of precise biomechanical effects without cast alteration or resetting teeth. The appliance is practically invisible. Therefore, patient's acceptance is usually enthusiastic. A variety of biomechanical forces can be realized. Tooth movement is rapid and precise. Fabrication cost is a fraction of conventional appliances. Chair side modifications of the initial appliance can be made quickly and precisely. Let's talk about fabricating a temporary bridge using Essex technology because it is sometimes necessary not only to retain teeth but to replace some anterior teeth. Those that are congenitally missing, such as laterals or an anterior tooth lost through trauma. Fabrication involves obtaining an accurate working cast and to place separating medium in the edentulous alveolar ridge area. Trim the base of the appropriate pontic to fit the edentulous alveolar ridge. Then, with a burr, cut a large mesiodistal trench across the lingual surface of the pontic. It should be at least four millimeters wide and three millimeters deep. When the plastic sheet is thermoformed over this pontic, it will conform to the trench, creating a mechanical lock to hold the pontic in the appliance. Tack the pontic to the cast with quick cure, or better yet, light cured acrylic. Don't use wax. It will melt during thermoforming. Then, thermoform O30 Type A Essex plastic sheet over the cast. 
remove the cast from the plastic as previously described and trim to form. I suggest reversing the wear schedule for an Essex Bridge patient since it will be worn all day for obvious aesthetic reasons it might be advisable not to wear it while sleeping and remember the Essex Bridge is also a retainer therefore duplicate appliances are indicated. 